My name is Alan Journey. I'm the co-facilitator of Southern Oregon Climate Action Now. SOCAN, as we call ourselves, is a grassroots all-volunteer organization of area residents who, are, who care about climate change. We're committed to promoting education and awareness about climate change and encouraging people to take bold action to, to address it. We meet the last Tuesday of each month at the Medford Public Library, right around the corner, and you are all, of course, invited to join us. Now, it's my great pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's program, Jeffrey Riley, News Director and host of the Jefferson Exchange on Jefferson Public Radio. Thank you for joining us, Jeffrey. Thank you very much, Alan. And I want to hand it to Alan Journey and Hannah Soul of SOCAN for doing a splendid job of organizing this evening. Uh, they really made my job uh, very easy and even for the candidates as well. And what a great crowd. Thank you all so much for coming. I know it was hard to pull yourself away from the TV on this first night of the National Hockey League season. <laughs> and I want to thank Major League Baseball for finishing up all the other stuff yesterday so we can have a little break here in between. Uh, lovely group. Good to see you all here. As you can see, we have now shut down the Art Kruger wing. <laughs> love you having tonight. So, uh, the organizing team invited candidates or their representatives for the following races. For State Senate District 3, Dr. Alan Bates, Colonel Dave Dodder, and Art Kruger were all invited we have running to succeed himself, Senator Alan Bates. <laughs> For Jackson County Commissioner Position 1, the invites went out to Kurt Ankerberg, Kurt Chancellor, Rick Dyer, and Tanya Morrow. Tanya Morrow is here. And for County Commissioner Position 3, the invites went out to Colleen Roberts and Kevin Talbert. Kevin Talbert is here. The scheduling of the forum was established according to the availability of those indicating a wish to participate. You would have to ask the people themselves why they didn't show up tonight. Uh, at the end of the program, there will be a reception to meet the candidates. I want to identify a few people in the audience who uh, um, we're going to out them as public officials. Uh, Judge Adam Peterson, who's also running for re-election, back over here. From the RBTD District Board and former Medford City Council member, Bill Mansfield. Anybody else willing to be outed as a public official tonight? Didn't think so. Carol Doty. Carol Doty. From the library board. There she is. Hi, Carol. All right, the format for this evening, I will ask each question to all of the candidates for a position, which means therefore one. Each candidate will have the designated length of time to respond, so the first round of questions, two minutes, we get down to one minute toward the end. If I believe that an answer given by a candidate needs clarification or more explanation, I'm going to ask a follow-up question. I'm going to ask the audience to refrain from applause or other demonstrative nature things about letting them know how you feel until the event is over. And you can give them a big round of applause at the end, as you did at the beginning. Uh, as promised to the candidates, the questions from the team were sent to the candidates three weeks ago. Timekeeper down here in front will notify each when 30 seconds, 15 seconds, and no seconds remain. And if they haven't gotten the, the, the clue by then, I will say time. So, uh, by the first rotation, Senator Alan Bates gets number, question number one first. And this is, creating renewable energy is a dynamic growth industry in this country. Consistently, a 2011 report released by the Rogue Valley Council of the Governments and Partners indicated that promoting energy efficiency and renewable energy in the Rogue Valley could generate jobs. What will you do in office to promote the ability of the Rogue Valley to capture new jobs in these fields? Two minutes. Oh, thank you. First, uh, is the mic working? Uh, no. No? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, first, I think we should uh, kind of recognize where we're sitting tonight. The building we're presently in is a platinum building. I don't know if many of you knew that. Uh, Kurt Schrader, myself, and uh, Ted uh, Kulongoski, then governor of the state of Oregon, put this project together over a lot of opposition, uh, uh, upstate primarily, some local, frankly. We got this building up, and we insisted that it be uh, a platinum building with uh, solar on the roof, great air conditioning that was uh, effective but not costly and proper installation. It produced a tremendous number of jobs right here in the valley. It was built by local people. I know that the, the lead electrician was one of my patients. He and I had long talks about it. They came in uh, under, under cost in a month ahead of schedule. Yeah. Uh, it was a real <laughs> so this is the kind of thing we can do. 
Uh, I don't know how many of you know about the Energy Trust. Uh, it was set up by the legislature in 2000. Uh, we take 3% of, uh, of the revenues that are uh, produced by um, energy companies, primarily electrical utility companies. We take that 3% as in a trust uh, to be used for renewables. Uh, that money is, is a huge amount of money now because as the costs go up, of course, we've got 3%. I don't believe we've gotten our fair share of it here in uh, Southern Oregon. We need to move more of that down here so that a place like uh, True South and others can start working on commercial buildings more and on uh, residential buildings more to help subsidize those things. Right now, you can commonly get uh, help with your building in your building of uh, if you're building a new home or refurbishing an old home with getting more conservation of energy in the building. That produces a lot more jobs. We have study after study after study that shows if you go to green, you, you dramatically increase the amount of people working to get you there. It produces more jobs. We need to need more of that in the Southern Oregon. Okay. Thank you, Senator Bates. Tanya Morrow, same question. If you need a repeat, I can give you one. But, okay. um, I'm real familiar with the uh, renewable energy assessment. Um, came across a, a, about a year, a little over a year ago and started working uh, with some folks to, to pick up the work of the RV COG um, and start assembling a group of, of folks to look at initially energy efficiency and then eventually we wanted to convene groups to start looking at um, solar and wind and that kind of thing. But that work is ongoing and I've been really honored to be a part of it. And so what we've got uh, together so far are people like um, representatives from Clean Energy Works, um, RHT Energy Solutions, um, we've got even Pacific Power is interested at this point as well. And so what I want to do as a county commissioner is continue that work um, with the support of the, of the commission. Uh, obviously I'm only uh, one potential member of the, the county commission, but I think the county needs to champion that kind of work. And so what, what we're talking about is you know, finding the the hurdles and and, and what where the um, the problems are for for jump starting and ramping up that effort. So when we do that, if it means that we need to bring real federal credit union in and um, get some guarantee for for funding that they could provide for these projects, that's the kind of work we're doing. Bringing people together to do it, and um, it will mean that we'll we'll probably be needing you know. The kind of workforce we're going to impact are laborers, uh, contractors, uh, you even will probably be needing additional energy assessors and that kind of thing, and even potential financiers and marketers to do this work. So <laughs> it's something that, uh, you know, will will <laughs> wrap up. <laughs> okay. Definitely, uh, that's the work I want to continue. And then there's turning to solar. I, I hope to create an electrical kind of infrastructure based on solar power, both for, for our, our you know, our buildings as well as our transportation. So, thanks. Kevin Talbert. Well, thank you. I, I want to say a couple things uh, right off the bat. First of all, uh, in the craziness of the campaign, I never received these six questions. So I'm, I'm going to speak without them because I think I'm familiar with the issues, but I didn't have a chance to write out my answers ahead of time. Uh, secondly, I'd like to pick up where Senator Bates left off talking about uh, this building, this uh, lead platinum building and my wife Barbara Talbert and I both served on the planning committee for this building and we talked a lot about how we could achieve energy efficiency and have this building which was part SOU and part RCC uh, really be a model for what we could do and, and, and show people what's what's possible and you know what it didn't cost much more it cost a little bit more but not very much and it's a it's really a standard that we could all uh, aspire to so in terms of uh, you know what we can do in regional efforts, uh, I, I can't help but think back to the, the notion of uh, think globally and act locally. And commissioners don't have a chance to set policy at a, a global, a national, or even a state level as Senator Bates will, will be able to do. But we can do a lot here, right, right here. And uh, as Tanya has said, uh, the county commissioners, if we could just get two county commissioners that are willing to make some changes, it would be a sea change in the, the, the way in which the county is operating. And we could draw attention to areas that people think are important, uh, such as the clean energy and climate change areas. Now, I do want to give some credit to the people that are there now. I was at the county commissioner meeting this morning, and the commissioners just passed the approval to apply for a red zone, 
a rural renewable energy district, the red zone. And that will mean that if there are organizations or businesses that want to generate energy here through renewable resources, could be hydro, could be uh, biomass, could be uh, 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 solar, could, could, could be wind, if there are people that produce that, they are going to be able to qualify, just like in terms of an, an enterprise zone, for tax credits for three to five years, right so that it makes sense to make that investment here in the Rome Valley. Thank you, Kevin. That takes care of question number one. I'm going to change the rotation just a little bit because with our crew not here, we would have had Senator Bates starting twice. So uh, we'll start this round with Tanya Morrow. And this is about uh, climate change adaptation. Two minutes for each of you. What specific proposals would you initiate or support as Senator or Jackson County Commissioner to help the rural community of Jackson County prepare for the effects of a changing climate, for example, more severe droughts and wildfires, paying particular attention to the agriculture and forests of the region? Um, yeah, the impacts we're gonna we're gonna feel at least initially are, are what we're already feeling. You know, less snowpack, um, you know, um, increased wildfire, smoke in our valleys. So we need to we need to deal with the drought issues. And one of the things that we can do to address drought and particularly with an agricultural um, impact is to adopt the Wise Project that's called the Water for Irrigation Streams and Economy. Um, I don't know if any of you know about it, but uh, Kevin and I and some of the other candidates were able to go out on a tour recently um, and, and was, were given uh, an assessment of that project. They're still working on cost-benefit analysis and feas feasibility, but it looks like it is um, sort of a no-brainer. We, we just need to make this investment. It will help us uh, conserve about 30 to 40 percent of our waters which means potentially that we can increase our agricultural production by 20 to 30, 30 to 40 percent. Because right now, all the allocated water rights are not being serviced. But it also will help us hedge against uh, issues with regard to the climate basin that we, that we may end up with in, in the future. One of the things I love about that project is that it also has the potential of producing $5 million in hydropower if we put in some hydro pro projects along the, um, the, the piping, uh, maybe I forgot to, to mention, it's actually about piping our irrigation ditches. So that's one thing. I also want to incentivize to do gray water systems, rain catchment systems in, in the rural areas. That's another way we conserve water. With regard to fires, we need to, we need to demand that our forests, uh, our, our federal government are, are providing the funds so we can go in and clean up those forests and get some of that biomass out so we don't have catastrophic fires. We also have to worry about the health and safety impacts. We're going to have, you know, with hotter summers, we're going to have increased allergens, poor air quality, and we need to address those and make sure that people aren't suffering from, from health effects of the fire and the smoke in the, in the valleys. And then lastly, um, we also need to place some additional emphasis on our emergency services to make sure we're, we're, we're ready to, to deal with some of those issues as well. Kevin Talbert, um, helping the rural community of Jackson County prepare for the effects of a changing climate. Two minutes. Well, specifically, uh, you know, I think things happen because you have a plan and you have uh, specific uh, goals that you're trying to reach and you have a strategy for reaching those goals. And, and what I think the county really needs to do is, is to be intentional. And the commissioners have a chance to make it intentional by creating a policy. I've been out interviewing the heads of the various county units, and we have a lot of great employees of Jackson County, head of uh, you know transportation and building and facilities and uh, you know other planning and other departments, and you know they all want to do the right thing, but the commissioners have not provided them guidance. Uh, so what I'd like to see is the county could. Uh, uh, they should, we should work with the community, we should work with expertise that we have here, we should engage county employees and people that are knowledgeable, and we'll create a, a task force or, or our committee to identify what the county could do to minimize its carbon footprint. And then we need some strategy, you know, we identify a goal, maybe it's 5, 10, 20 percent, and that we cre create a infrastructure where county employees then are held accountable for how are they going to do that. We, you know, we have nearly 300 vehicles that we operate in the county. Right now, when we purchase those vehicles, we can make no consideration about their efficiency. When we decide, uh, you know, how, how much they're driven, we don't have a policy that guides that. Uh, when we build, I, I believe that Jackson County is trying to build to lead standards because it's energy efficient right now, but there's no policy, there's no one helping the, 
people accountable for doing that. So we need to look at that. We need to look at recycling, you know, within the county, whether it's, you know, paper and ink cartridges or building materials. We need to have a strategy, we need to have a goal, and we need to hold people accountable. And so I, I think there, there, there's a, in building codes, if I can just mention one last one here, is we, we enforce minimum building codes in Jackson County at this the state building codes. We could say maybe there's some green things we could do that wouldn't cost much that we could add to our building codes here in the county. Senator Allen Bates, two minutes on climate change adaptation, Thanks. rural areas. Well, first off, did over both what they've said. I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, I'm in a funny position as a state senator. I don't have a lot of control over what the counties and cities do uh, other than moving something on a statewide basis that affects them. And so we're careful when we do that. Uh, the WISE project is one which put money into from the state level, and I appreciate your comments on it. Uh, I've got I've got an 80-acre farm right now that we buried all our pipes and put in sprinkling and stopped flooding. It's, it's a huge change as far as the amount of water we use. We need to move that across the board. Um, in the forest, we've just got to really hammer our congressional delegation. We've got to clear out the underbrush. This doesn't mean clear cutting or cutting timber. It means clearing out underneath. I went up to the forest fires uh, twice this year and talk to the people fighting those fires. And what happens is those fires blow up underneath and then blow up the top of the trees, which isn't normal. And then they cap across the top and you have a fire you can't control. And these forests are so stressed now by uh, global warming that they're just tinder dry and ready to go. So we have to help protect those and manage those better. At a statewide level, we've already done one thing I think we should be proud of. One, Oregon was a dumping ground for many years for inefficient washing machines and, and uh, inefficient uh, uh, hot water tanks, all that kind of stuff, because we didn't have any regulation on it. So the, the ones that were built poorly were dumped into Oregon. So two sessions back, we changed that, moved our fishing ratings up, and got rid of that happening. The other thing we can do at state level now, we're going to have to look at very carefully, is talking about a statewide change and what kind of flow you have through your uh, shower heads, how much, how much water you use when you flush. That's something we have to do statewide. We can do statewide, which will help Jackson County. So those are the kind of changes we can do at this level. Uh, we're really talking about adaption as something that's really pretty terrible. Uh, next question is the one that I really want to get into with you. That's mitigation, which is where the, where the game plan really is. All right. Just as the stop sign comes up. Kevin Talbert, you'll start this rotation. Question number three is about climate change mitigation. Two minutes again on each of these. Uh, for each of you, rather. The state of Oregon has established a goal to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 75% by the year 2050. What specific proposals would you initiate or support as Senator or Jackson County Commissioner to reduce Oregon's or Jackson County's contribution to climate change? Well, I spoke a little bit about that last time with identifying a whole variety of things that the county could do in its own operations because I think you have to model things. But I do want to speak a little bit to you know, how we approach this issue strategically within the county. Uh, you know, we've got people that have a broad spectrum of views in our county. And um, one of the things I learned with the environmental movement is we used to, you know, kind of criticize the people that didn't see the world quite the way we did. And what happened with that? Well, we, we created a polarized point of view. And you know what happened? Not much happened because we're just fighting each other and we're trying to demonize the other side. So I think one of the greatest challenges with, with clean energy and climate change is to find a way to engage people across the spectrum so that people don't see this as a political issue, but as a human issue and for the welfare of our county. And so I, I, I think that looking for the opportunities that, that, that are available here is really important. I mean, we have Greg Jones, you know, many of you know here in our community, a professor at SOU and uh, an expert in viticulture and in the cidering of wineries. Climate change is going to change the environment, not only here but elsewhere, in a way that makes this a particularly attractive area for many people. And we're going to see increased population, whether we like it or not, because of that, because there are some desirable aspects here. So what are the opportunities for that? Well, maybe we have some niche crops. We have the GMO ban that's going to actually give us some advantages with our local organic farmers. I mean, there are some things that we can do here that are going to provide opportunities. And I think that's a way of engaging people that haven't really seen how these, these changes provide opportunities. They're not just problems. We don't want to just criticize people who don't see it the way we do. But we want to engage them and help them solve, help have them help us solve these issues. Senator Allen Bates, this is the one you were championing at the bit for. Yes, thank you. Um, 
I think this is the most important question tonight. I hope we have a chance to talk about it more. Uh, I want to get to the questions from the audience. Mitigation, from my point of view, is really the name of the game here. Um, the only adaption you want and all the rest of the things you want to do, but if you don't mitigate this, it's, it's never going to it's never going to be a problem that's going to be resolved. I believe 50 years from now, people look back and say this was the issue of the day. This was the issue of the day, and too many people are ignoring it. We have a, a division in this country about it. You can see that division on this panel right up here. If you think about it, we have one group that doesn't think global warming is real, and one group that thinks it's very real and very dangerous. I want you to draw your own conclusions that who's on which side of that question. Mitigation, you can look at a lot of things. You can look at the things we've talked about already, but the scale of those is too small. To really scale this up, you've got to start pricing carbon. You have to get serious about it and price carbon. British Columbia's done it, Washington, California are ready to go, we go. All the studies we've seen on it say if you start pricing carbon, people really dramatically change what they're doing, and it produces more jobs. The story that, that reduces jobs just isn't true. Every good study done shows that if you start going green, you produce more jobs for your region. Pricing carbon, quite frankly, has the T word in it, the carbon tax. You've got to go there if you're going to change this. It can be neutral, and it should be neutral. You want people to pay more for burning carbon, but get that back in some other form. Reduced income tax, reduced property tax. There's a dozen ways of doing it that you've got to set can be looked at. But if you don't price carbon, we'll never get there. And, and that isn't just something we do in Oregon, or Washington, or California, or British Columbia. It tells the rest of the world the right way to go, the right way to do things. And it gives us immediate uh, economic boost. We've seen it over and over again, and we can do it here, and we should do it. In the next session, we're going to need 18 votes in the Senate and 36 votes in the House to pass that. It's going to be a tough haul, but we need to do it. How to reduce Jackson County's contribution to climate change. All right, and I'll, I'll start with that. Um, that will be done at the state level, but it, it, in order for it to get done, we need really strong leadership at the local level to get out there in the community and, and talk about it. And I'm not talking about you know challenging people's uh, beliefs in science or not. I'm just talking about the, just selling the benefits of, of actually moving and transitioning to clean energy. I think we can do it, and I think we can even sell, uh, you know, the carbon pricing. It, it shouldn't be a problem. We just need to engage the community. Because all of it's about, really, this exciting transition to a, to a different kind of economy. And the number of jobs that, that we can create is just amazing. And it's exciting to me, anyway. So, but other work we can do at the county level including, includes embracing the, the state's, you know, um, goals of reducing by, to, to 75% um, by 2050. And then we can join, the state's got some programs out there we need to tap into. There's a cutting edge community program, there's a region, regional solutions network, and those programs will help us potentially fund some, from some of our own projects, but it'll, they'll also help program and advance any efforts that we, we can plan and, and engage in. Um, we are also engage in um, the transition to clean energy with regard to transportation, as far as I'm concerned. We really need to focus on that um, as well. And that would include really looking at whether we need to convert our fleet to electric electric cars, even if it might cost us a little bit right now, because it'll just help spur the market as well. So we need to, we need to look at all those factors as well. Um, I want to look at ins installation of solar generation, and we'll, the county will look at um, continuing efficiency work. With regard to community planning, I think we need to um, in include development. We need to incentivize development to integrate energy sources into the projects, um, or at least make them capable of, of um, integrating those kind of things, like making sure that the, the development is placed on in an area where we can put solar on it later if we don't get the developers to do it right then. Um, all right. Let's see. Good place to start. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Um, with the permission of the candidates and the uh, the timer judge, since we only have three of you here, when nine things went out, nine invitations went out, uh, rather than go to one minute answers on the next two questions, I'm going to go to two minutes. I assume that's not a problem for anybody running for office. <laughs> so Senator Bates, you're at the top of this list again. So this is uh, the question about the LNG. LNG. Which are one of the main costs and benefits of the Jordan Co. Pacific Connector Liquefied Natural Gas Pipeline and Export Facility? Do you support it or not? Well, I'll start by saying I don't support it. Uh, you want to hear why, but I'll tell you why. We have two minutes now. Um, 
and it's important, I, I admit, that it's important to Coos Bay, uh, an area that the state has really been uh, in trouble for a long time economically, and they, and they really want to understand that. Um, but you have to run this pipe through uh, areas that I think are environmentally uh, sensitive. You have to run it down there for 20 years, and after 20 years you have to probably abandon it. Uh, you're not moving in the right direction as far as you know, green is concerned. You're, you're exporting uh, more fuel into China and countries we, we actually you know, economically have a battle with over manufacturing. So you're helping them and not, and not helping yourselves. There's all kinds of reasons not to do this. But the biggest one goes back to mitigation. We're never going to get to a, a green situation, a green world we want, as long as we're still fracking gas and oil out of the ground and shipping through pipes and trains all over the world and, and getting short-term gains from that for long-term losses. It just, it just doesn't make sense to me. It sends the wrong message. It's opposite what we should be doing. And I, I know our pipe fitters and our construction guys really want this job in the next 20 years and really want to make the money from it. I'd rather see them installing solar panels and, uh, and uh, hot water heaters and roofs and things of that nature. I think we can get them the jobs they need without doing something that I think is just taking us in the wrong direction. So I'll just stop there. Okay. Yeah. Right, tell you tomorrow. And I, I'd say I, I agree with all of that. Um, it just, the, the costs are, are they just outweigh any of the potential benefits. And again, I feel really sympathetic about Coos Bay, but, and I intend to, you know, to the extent that we have some, some um, influence in the project, and of course the county will, you know, I think it's already indicated that it is in favor of the project, but you know we need we need to to work with Goose Bay and and get them to see that there's there's a better way of of uh, employing their people. Maybe we need some wind out on the coast instead of um, tankers. But one of the one of the things that really bugs me about this project is the fiction that you know that it justifies the eminent domain even uh, because what all it's gonna all it's gonna do is enrich enrich the gas companies, many of most of which I think are all the Canadian companies, at the you know at, at a cost of the increased fracking and all the effects of the, of the, the folks that are, are living with that. Um, of course, the increased potential to uh, the cost of our own natural gas. Um, and the only people that benefit are, are going to be the gas companies. So th that really is a horrible fiction and, it, you know, it just really bugs me. But beyond that, the same thing Senator Bates said, the infrastructure is wrong. It's, it's going backwards. We don't need to, to build this infrastructure. And besides, the benefits are really ultimately they're gonna you know they employ a bunch of people to do the, the pipeline but then the facility is only gonna employ I think less than a hundred people and a lot of those people are probably gonna come from out of the community anyway so it, it, you know it's not gonna be a real long-term gain and then the last thing that, uh, about it is I think it actually has a, a greater carbon footprint because by the time you cool that gas and then uncool it or whatever it's done. The energy that's taken to actually transform it so that it, it liquefies actually is about the same as, as the carbon. And then finally, there's the meth methane leakage problem. So anyway. <laughs> Three seconds of mine. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys know that when methane leaks, it's, it's, got a, it's, it's, it's worse than burning carbon. So we got, you know, if, if, if it's going to happen, we need to make sure that the leakage issue is actually, there's some strong rules to enforce that. Thank you, Tanya. Yeah, Kevin Talbert, two minutes on uh, Jordan Cove, LNG. First, I'd like to just make sure that everybody knows that this is a Federal Energy Regulatory Commission FERC decision, and any uh, influence that might occur not at the federal level is going to occur at the state level. The governor may make a decision on this. Uh, the county commissioners are not going to be deciding this issue. So what you're really hearing, I think, from us are you know personal opinions. And um, I, I guess I'd want to say that this has been a really hard issue for me. Of all the issues that I've faced in this campaign, this is why it really kind of tore me apart because uh, I understand that, and you know, in my heart feel some of the same concerns about um, fracking and about the, the environmental concerns. But, uh, and uh, it's kind of interesting going out and talking to people in other parts of the county, as Tanya mentioned, there's a concern about eminent domain. People don't want their property taken for this. So it'd be really easy for me to say, uh, you know, I'm just on board with what the senator and, and my colleague have said. But, uh, but you know, I, I was at a conference in Coos Bay just a few uh, weeks ago with, the, with all of the 17 community colleges, and we talked a lot about opportunity for uh, students in, uh, coming out of community colleges and where jobs would be. And talking to people in Coos Bay, 
this, it, it, you know, just put yourself in their shoes uh, for a minute. A community that's been economically depressed for a long time, they haven't had much opportunity, and they see the Jordan Cove development as something that's really going to help them, not only in the short term for about six years of construction, it's actually going to help the Rogue Valley because a lot of the contractors, I think Senator Bates acknowledges, are going to come from the Rogue Valley. And there is, there are, there will be an ongoing uh, 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 economic commitment uh, from this project. And, um, you know, it, it, it's easy to say, uh, you know, not in my backyard, but we are uh, neighbors here and we need to, to think about that. So this, is, this has been a tough issue for me. Thank you, Kevin Tilber. All right, question number five, we'll go two minutes again. Uh, this is about the general opinion on climate change. Tanya Mara will start this one. I only prepared for one minute, because really, it's about science, right? Speak more okay. slowly. <laughs> I'll use some time on the question. What is your opinion of the scientific evidence that the planet is... I'm sorry, I should right, not be joking through this part. Right, so what is your opinion of the scientific evidence that the planet is warming and human activities are a substantial contributor? Please explain what has led to the development, in your opinion. Um, the development of your opinion, sorry. Um, well, I think the science is reliable. I can just start there, but um, someone's, someone said there are just three relevant facts. CO2 traps heat. Two, the concentration of CO2 is rising. Three, We've burned twice as many fossil fuels as needed to account for the observed rise in, in the um, CO2. So the rest, we believe, is in the oceans and, and creating acid, acid, acidification right now. So you know, then you have those three facts, some of which we've known for years and years and years, generations. Um, but then, of course, we have you know, the peer review process itself and the fact that we've got over 14, about 14,000 peer review articles with only 24 uh, refuting, you know, any suggesting that there is no uh, climate change and it's not human cause. So again, the science is reliable to me. I, that's, that's where I, my opinion is, I believe the science. I don't need to talk, we don't need to talk about the science and that's a, that's a nice thing. We really don't. We just can talk about the great things that we will accomplish in, in transitioning to clean energy. And so, we don't, you know, the science is there. If we need to get in that debate, we can, but I'm not a scientist. I do know policy, and I do know that we, can, we need to address the issue and prepare for the issue, and it's, it's simple. We're going to move to a, to a new energy type of a, a economy. So I'll maybe move on back to something else. No. <laughs> there's no bank of time. So. Okay. Kevin Tyler. Well, I think there's incontrovertible, incontrovertible evidence that there's we are experiencing global warming and climate change. I, I, I don't have any, any questions about the science personally. Uh, I'm more concerned about how we uh, act as a, as a community to be able to do something about it. And as I said earlier, I don't think by polarizing ourselves we're going to help actually make the changes that we'd like to see. You know, if, if we do have a change in commissioners, we can bring, it, bring a different perspective. But we do have to get other people on board. So we've got to figure out ways to, to, see, to, to uh, get collaboration, get consensus, and, and move our county forward. I've, I identified a whole series of things I think the county can do in terms of its own activities to, to, to model what, what others need to do. I, I agree with many of the programs that Tanya has, has uh, promoted uh, in the community. Uh, you know, we could, we could uh, put a lot of people to work, uh, you know, doing energy efficiencies that would reduce our, our carbon footprint. And, and we could engage uh, businesses and utilities and, uh, and other people in our efforts. Uh, but, but we have to do it in a way that gets people on board. And, I, you know, I, I intend to be a bridge in our community to try to make things possible because to, to just want something isn't enough to make it happen. And uh, so I, I, I want to be a political realist about this. Uh, even though I, I, I clearly see what the evidence shows, and there's there's no doubt in, in my mind. Senator Allen Bates, the science question. No, thank you. Um, in my mind, the science is clear too. Uh, I get most of my science readers from Scientific American. That's I get that, and I read it pretty carefully. Uh, I like the medical stuff and everything else. And we've been talking in Scientific American about this for now for five, six, seven, eight years. Article after article after article. And these are peer-reviewed, good articles. 
I don't know if there's any question what's going on at our plant, and we're causing it. I don't know if there's any question about that either. You can call it climate change if you want to, because it's more politically correct, but really it's, it's climate warming, and then you get climate change as a result of it. Um, I think the real question before us is not that. I mean, you look back at history, the one that burned, you know, Galileo the stake for saying that uh, where Ju Jupiter had moons and that we were going around the sun, but some people always will fight you on these issues from the bad point of view, but bottom line is it's happening, it's real, we're causing it. The real question is what do we, what do, we do to stop it? And I'm going to go back to mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. You've got to put the true cost of carbon on carbon. People understand that. They will stop using so much carbon to go as efficiently as they can in their lives and, uh, and get off uh, fossil fuels. Thank you, Senator Bates. We're on to the, uh, the final question delivered in advance. We will have the audience questions after this. And Kevin Talbert will start this version. It is two minutes on the general relevant vision on climate change and working with it. Uh, the question reads, in terms of A, energy supply and renewable energy development, and B, preparing for climate change, what is your vision for the Rogue Valley in 20 years, and what will you do to achieve that vision? Well, I outlined a lot of things that the county can do, but in, in terms of, you know, 20 years from now, wouldn't be, wouldn't it be great if we had a bunch of renewable energy sources here in our county? I don't know how many of you know that we produce about energy for about 3,000 homes in Jackson County from the Dry Creek landfill for meth, from methane. And that is a, you know, just using our, our waste products and we're generating that methane. It's a very effective form of, of energy. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the WISE project, this way in which we can uh, pipe and encapsulate our water supply for irrigation and capture the energy that comes from it coming from the high lakes down to our valley and produce energy through hydro. We have a potential for some wind and some solar energy in this valley. So 20 years from now, I'd like to see a lot of renewables contributing. And I'm not sure exactly what the percentage is, but maybe we'll have a significant part of our energy generated here locally. And I'd like to see us realize that we still have a lot to do in terms of conserving energy that will reduce our carbon footprint. We've got to get out and change households. You know, you walk around after a new snowfall in my neighborhood, and I walk by houses where we have snow on the roof that's, you know, three or four inches uh, deep, and uh, the next morning I look and I can just see where the rafters are and the penetrations are. That's low-hanging fruit. That home is, is burning a lot of carbon to heat a house that's not insulated. Now, why can't we help people that have those situations to change that? And, and that's a vision. So I want, 20 years from now, I don't want to see a lock around. And I think we in the county have a chance to make a difference that way. So it's, it's finding, uh, whether it's the low-hanging fruit like conservation or the kind of looking ahead to alternate uh, resources. And also, as, as I've repeatedly said, a county where the majority of people in the county see the importance of this and are on board and doing everything they can do in their personal lives to make a difference, because that'll make a bigger difference than we can make through government. Yeah. Senator Allen Bates, two minutes, Rogue Valley in 20 years. Uh, the vision thing. Um, 2035. <laughs> 2035. I'm not going to tell you all of them going to be in 2035. I'll be still um, You know, I, I do have a vision, I guess. I think about this. Uh, sometimes the back door to just sit and think about where, where are we going with this? Where are we really going with this and how are we going to get there? And my vision is, is I think of all the things I hear and think about as far as uh, being uh, efficient and uh, driving in a different direction. Now it's not a broken record here. If we put a serious uh, price on carbon, I think people will go to electric cars. I think we'll go to self-driven electric cars. If you've seen some of the studies in these cars, they are incredibly efficient because they're not stopping and going, they're sensing each other, and moving uh, through, through communities very efficiently. Um, I think that uh, we can develop a lot more from a hydropower here in our area. Uh, I've been up to generate, I don't even notice so there's two big tubes go by when you go up towards Diamond Lake that uh, drop down over the edge of the system generators. I've been down there many times. Um, the old days, probably illegally, I would fly fishing in there. <laughs> but you could flip the switch in those days. Uh, there's generators as big as a house in there, and they can be enlarged, and we can put more generators in. They've been there since the 1930s or 40s. We can produce more power locally, the screen, from hydropower. We can do it from uh, wind, uh, and we can do it from regeneration of wood products. Uh, we can do all those things. 
Uh, and I would like to see a vision also where people, uh, uh, so everyone has solar on their house. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a hot water tank on the roof. Yeah. And we really start moving in a direction that we're using less and less carbon. And I'm hoping that in 2050, when I know I won't be here, that burning carbon will be a thing of the past. We'll stop doing it and it'll be done. Uh, I won't be here to see it, but we can start moving in that direction. And the carbon tax that we are talking about getting next session is the most single important thing that we could do to drive everything in that direction. And I'll stop. Thank you. So, please, thanks. John Yamaha. Division thing. This was the hardest question for me because I realized I needed to tap into my right brain, which I don't have a big capacity for, but I'm going to try. I think I told you a little bit about what I want to do, so maybe you have an abstract image of, of what I see our vision as. But I believe that this, this is a, a great challenge for a generation, and that challenge is actually going to bring us together. I think that through addressing these challenges, planning for them, we are actually going to be a community that really understands that we, but we all do better individually when we all do better together. So I see that as a vision for our, our community in 20 years. But I also see us. I'm, I'm ready to say let's. We're gonna we're gonna um, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions by 100% in 20 years. I'm ready to to, to take that goal on. Um, our, our valley is green and clean with solar arrays catching all, catching all the power we need to, for our technology and our, for our movement. Um, we're independent from the fluctuations of other energy markets. We live probably in a more urban way because it's more efficient to do that. Those living in the rural areas are going to be more likely to be actually producing from the land. Um, and those, right, this is this one I thought was key. Sorry. <laughs> Those urban centers that we have are gonna they need to be healthy, but one of the things I do see we probably need to do, at least in the short term, is actually have some more swimming pools in our urban areas because we people are gonna need to get out of the heat and so there we go. <laughs> but here we go. The other thing is, is we're gonna have all the young people in the audience here, they're gonna be raising their kids or watching them move into adulthood. And those kids are still going to be able to hunt and to fish and to raft the rivers and to boat on our lakes. And I, I think we can get there because we just need to talk about, again, all the benefits of moving to a clean energy economy. Thanks. This is a good chance to give them a round of applause. They've gotten through the end. And now it's time for questions from the audience. So, waiting for the green cards to arrive down here, each of you we will get... a question to the audience. Pardon me? I want to ask a question to Ms. Billy, Mrs. Billy. Oh, you want her to <laughs> I want to hear what you... I want to hear more about what you called me about two or three days ago. Well, I'd like to speak to that very briefly because it is about... Do you mind? May I make it Please, go ahead, sure. I'll let everybody else weigh in too. Okay. Uh, I was fortunate because I'm now in a library district, which is a governmental entity now, okay. uh, to be asked how I thought about uh, establishing this rural redevelopment zone, this renewable energy zone for the county. And our board voted unanimously to support this. And I asked Senator Bates if he would help us because they have to get a designation through Oregon Business, and he can help us do that. So I asked him to approach the county and offer his assistance. Now, I want to know what you did. <laughs> <laughs> you might guess I've been a little busy. So I, I understand. Did, I, did, I did make phone calls and leave messages. I didn't get a, a direct response. But I, I think they've already moved in that direction. And what I heard, I thought, from you and others, and if we do this, there's a possibility of people, of companies who make solar panels and, and uh, similar materials actually moving here to do that. Three, as I understand it, um, three plants have been proposed to the Board of Commissioners already, and they're very interested, which is really what prompted them to establish or to try to get this designation for this county. And, it, and I'm sorry I can't remember all the terms, but it's rural, renewable, development, Energy, energy district. Zone. Energy district. Energy zone. Red. So yeah. we'll be, we will be pushing hard on that quickly. Yeah. Just like we got the E zone. Yes, All right. 
With the other two, you have to wait well, can, can, can I just mention, because I was at the meeting this morning and these questions came up about, is this for people who are going to produce solar panels or wind turbines? And the fact is we have an energy zone, we have an enterprise zone that will give tax breaks to those companies right now. This is for people who are going to produce power and put it into the grid, not manufacture the components. So we have both, and Senator Bates has been instrumental in getting both of those for us. So it's, a, it's really a, a, a forward-looking thing for our county. Tony, what do you think? Um, I just have to say more power to it, I guess. Some of the <laughs> <laughs> well done. Uh, Waiting for that one. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, I, I hope it means, you know, uh, more en energy independence for us, too. Because, I mean, one of the things I, I really look forward to, if I, I'm able to, to, to get into office, is to have the time to really learn about energy policy. And, and there's communities out there that are, are aggregating their, their need and being able to go out and um, negotiate for, for power. And I don't know if we need statewide legislation in order to do that. But, um, yes, let's, let's, bring on, let's bring on the solar arrays and start adding to the grid there. All right. Thanks, Carol Doty, for providing that information. Uh, all right, audience questions. We have quite a pile of them here. Uh, this rotation will start with Senator Bates. The question is, if industrial agriculture accounts for 40% of greenhouse gases and traditional organic agriculture sequesters large amounts of carbon, how would you encourage, I guess, organic agriculture in Jackson County? Well, I we did, we did it already to a great degree. We got that GMO uh, uh, passed. Uh, with Peter Bart and I fought that tooth and nail. Uh, again, a party divide on it. Um, Democrats wanted to have an opportunity for local communities to be GMO free if they chose to. Uh, that means they're going to be organic. Uh, and uh, we're pretty excited about that kind of thing happening. We'll continue to do that. We're going to go back and push back. Now, Lane County, um, Josephine County, um, uh, passed it. Lane County is getting ready to pass it. Uh, I think this is going to be something that's going to move across the state. I think a lot of uh, legislators have been out of touch with the public on this completely, and they're getting a wake-up call. I was up there right after it passed uh, talking to um, the senators from uh, Josephine County, and they were just stunned. They had led the charge not to allow local counties to be GMO-free, and lo and behold, it passes in their own. <laughs> so they were just like sitting there with deer and headlights, you know, sort of thing. But I think we're going to see this move, and I think we're going to continue. But what we need to do, I believe, you know, at the state level, is to allow local entities to make that decision. And, you know, I don't, I'm not ready for a ban statewide, but let local entities make that decision. I think we'll find most of Eastern Oregon because the wheat crops will go there. I think Lane County will go there. Um, the seed producers are going to go there yeah, pretty soon. There won't be much left in the, in the state that's not going to be uh, organic and not going to be GMO free. I think that's the direction we're going. And I'd love to see Oregon thought of as a, as a super green state as far as agriculture is concerned. Sonia yeah. Morrow, encouraging organic agriculture. Yeah, I don't think I have too much to add except for I, I guess I want to make a plug for as we move towards organics, and I agree, there's every reason to do it. Um, we. We, um, we foster the health of our soils, and, and that is extremely important for so many reasons, one of which is it's a, it's a way of, of conserving water use. Um, so, you know, all of this, um, if it's, you know, going organic helps us, you know, avoid uh, or access carbon sequestration, that's great. You know, maybe we can get some offsets for the county, too, so to get into that market. <laughs> um, but, so, yeah. Soils would be a, is, a, is another reason for us all to go towards organics. Kevin Talbert? I noticed Greg is here, one of the leaders of the GMO movement, and hey, we had to give credit to everybody that's here that worked on that because it really makes sense. And I, I, as I said other places in my campaign, I really put value-added agriculture at the, the, the top of the list because I think we have such an opportunity. And while I agree with Senator Bates that we should do it statewide, right now, Jackson County has an advantage. And let's take advantage of that. Let's, let, you know, I, I went out to the, uh, the seed workshop in the Applegate Valley a few weeks ago and just listened to seed producers talk about the challenge of preserving our heritage seeds and the right of people to save seeds 
and keep our, the diversity we have in the seed genomes and how important that is to agriculture here, here in our valley. And there are seed producers that are talking about relocating here in southern Oregon because maybe it's Jackson or maybe it's Josephine, but, but right here in southern Oregon we have some unique things because of our mountains and our air shed and our kind of productivity. We're not subject to some of the drift and uh, winds and <coughs> pollens and things that are, that are carried in other parts of the state. And, and we should, this area could be, can become known as the place where you can guarantee, particularly in seeds, but also in other agricultural products, GMO-free and uh, organic products. And it's a great opportunity for us because it's if we can make agriculture viable, we keep the green spaces, and the green spaces and the looking out at our pear orchards and our other things, our other ag our, our vineyards and our, and our other agri successful agricultural enterprises, keep the character of the valley that most of us value and the reason we live here. All right, one minute on the next question as well. This one, we'll start with uh, Tanya Morrow. This is about um, energy retrofits, that uh, retrofitting and renewable energy always seems connected to private residences and businesses, no mention of uh, homes owned by landlords. Uh, how can you address that? Yeah, that's, that's a difficult one. Um, we were talking with uh, Clean Energy Works just yesterday, I guess that was, and um, they have not targeted that market. And um, it's not necessarily because it's commercial, but it's, it's harder to find funding for those projects. And so, um, that, again, if that's, if that's a hurdle <laughs> we, we need to overcome, it's just a matter of getting the right people the table so we can create our own program and our own plan. And if that means, you know, again, we've got, we get the credit union there to, to talk about funding these projects and we get, I mean, uh, the energy trust to guarantee those loans, that's the kind of work we, we need to do and I'm excited to do it. I hope you elect me to it. <laughs> well, I don't know uh, the specifics of this. I, you know, I've worked with the Energy Trust of Oregon. Uh, and uh, have worked uh, with the Southern Oregon Sustainable Business Network around businesses trying to do the right thing. But I haven't gotten into the apartment and rental uh, units. So, you know, it, it's a policy issue, and I'm not sure if it's at the state or federal level, probably at the state level. We need to create incentives because, uh, you know, landlords are just like business people elsewhere. They're going to look at that bottom line and say, does it make sense for me to do this? And some of them are going to do it just because they believe it's the right thing. But the majority of people are going to say, does it pencil out? And so if we, in policymakers at the state or even at the, if the county can, can weigh in on this, can make it uh, create incentives, then, then we've done our job. And uh, like Tanya, I'd like to be there making that change. Senator Bates? Yeah, I, I hadn't heard this Bob Franklin before, and that's why I thumbed it. And he's in, he learns something every time you get there. Um, the Energy Trustees open that up. They're already doing it for commercial buildings. And look, you believe down the street here, with, they, they put almost 400,000 of that from the Energy Trust, if I remember my numbers correctly, plus what Lithia put in. Incredible building, if you ever have a chance to go look at it and see what's on the roof up there. That needs to be opened up for uh, commercial uh, dwellings, too, it's the same as every place else. Uh, a broken record here. Um, if you put a, a tax on carbon, you can get expensive enough, <laughs> those landlords are going to look at the building every month, and they're going to say, we've got to change something, and if you make a tax neutral, people who aren't ready for them are going to have enough money to step in there and say, say we're not going to pay that kind of money anymore, and they're going to become more efficient. It drives, it drives this whole thing. And places have done it, other countries have done it, they're the ones that show us the way. Mm -hmm. right, another audience question, Kevin Talbert starts this rotation. Mitigation is incredibly important, but our world will experience disturbances that impact our communities, economies, and natural systems. Communities need to start dealing with these changing conditions. What do you think is the appropriate action for the state and county to take to move this forward? One minute. Well, I kind of started with this this, this evening. I'd like to see the commissioners write, you know, next January, the, if, it, you know, and it takes two commissioners to do anything. So one commissioner can believe whatever they want, but you've got to persuade your colleagues. So if we can get two commissioners that say, let's make Jackson County a green county, then we can start talking about what, what I said. Let, let, let's consult with the people that have the most knowledge. Let's get a cross-section of people involved. Let's set goals for the county. And let's start with the county's own operations 
its buildings, its transportation fleet, its water use, all these things that make a difference with our carbon footprint. And, and let's have measurable goals and hold county people uh, accountable to achieve those goals. I think we can do that. And so that's the first step I would take. Senator Bates? Yeah, there's this two, I think it's a two-step process, I guess. First off, we have to look at the short term of what we're going to be facing in the next five, ten years. And forest fires and making sure we have a good water supply for our county and every place in the state. We have to secure that first. And at the same time, we've got to keep working on the long term, which is mitigating this, this to the point that it is not a huge problem for us. And that's 50-year, 60-year, 70-year window. So short term, it's going to be water, taking care of our forests, and doing everything we can to conserve, conserve, conserve both water and energy at the, at the local level. And this takes a lot to say about that, and we just haven't had a chance to step up and do it. Uh, frankly, we need majorities in both houses to do it, and if we don't have those, it's not going to happen. Any more? Uh, well, uh, this is just one of the things I say as the, as the reason why I'm running. Um, and you'll see it in the voters' pamphlet. Um, it's we need to look at those urban those systems that we have, both urban and ecosystems that the county has control over. And again, I'm talking about emergency services, communications, transportation, water, all of those systems. We need to do an assessment and figure out uh, and get some folks to the table, like the folks that, that have already d written reports about what the potential impacts are going to look like and what the potential remedies are, and sit down and see whether, whether we're ready for those uh, challenges or not. And if not, we need to we need to work on getting ready for them and finding the money to, to do the infrastructure changes that we need. All right. So we come back to Senator Allen Bates first for this one, which is what will you do to reduce VMT, vehicle miles traveled in the Rogue Valley? Well maybe a very modest trade off, I think. Um, you know, one of the things we don't think about very often is, is reducing the miles you do travel. Uh, as an example, um, uh, my office is in Medford, and uh, I had a hard time uh, driving half an hour each, each direction from my home in Ashland uh, and, and putting it through my brain about global warming. So we actually moved, um, and I'm five minutes from the office now, and sometimes I walk, I don't bicycle much, but uh, even then I'm only driving you know, for three or four minutes each direction now instead of an hour. Okay. And that's the kind of thing we have to do. We have to set up jobs and try to get jobs that are, and activities that are closer to where you're actually living. So you can move back and forth with bicycles, you can move back and forth with <coughs> walking, and you've cut down the number of trips you have to make. Uh, there's ways of doing that, and, and it really means changing how you think about your communities and how you think about your infrastructure. It's a longer discussion, I'm going to wrap it up, okay? But we have to start thinking about what we are as communities, what's going on in Phoenix, what's going on in town, what's going on in Nashville, what's going on in Bedford, and how you get people to stop driving so much and give them other opportunities, including transportation and other issues, mass transportation, other issues, including a train from Friends Pass to yeah. Nashville. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. I guess I'll throw out the railroad question now. That was in the study. Well, then, <laughs> yeah. Tanya Morrow. Uh, rail, rail, rail travel is on the list as well. I, I can't wait to learn about that. Mm -hmm. That aspect of the law and policy. Um, okay. Same stuff. We need, to, we need to make sure we've got a transportation infrastructure that is ready to, um, to engage uh, the electrical vehicles that we, we will have, um, including electrical bicycles, because I've got a hill I've got to go up. So. <laughs> but we need, to, we need to make sure that we're able, people, people are able to get around without having to get in the car. So that will also mean, again, the, our communities are going to end up be, becoming a little more urban because of, of these efficiencies. So 20 years from now, that's the way it's going to look. We, um, we need to... Um, Foster development that's wholly integrated, so it's not just residential. It includes those commercial components. And a lot of us are, I mean, the way the um, economy and the, our sectors are going, there's a lot of folks that are working at home anyway. So all of that planning we need to do, and some of it we, the county won't necessarily be involved in because we're not, you know, the ones that are accepting all of the urban growth. Um, so we need to encourage our local <coughs> cities to do that kind of planning as well. Kevin Talbert, DMT. Well, um, you know, we have a chance in this election to pass a, uh, a, a, a 
base to increase the RBTD services here in the valley. Yeah. 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 And if any of you have been at any of the hearings and listened to people testify, I mean, we're talking benefiting a whole range of people that otherwise are going to be in, you know, single vehicles or, or, have, or maybe won't even be able to do what they need to do, but we're talking students, we're talking uh, veterans, we're talking uh, people with disabilities, we're talking people that need to get to their physicians, that we're talking the elderly. I mean, there's a whole range of people right now that are going in, in cars or not getting to the places they need to go because we don't have adequate public transportation. So let's pass that ballot in November and give RBTV a chance. To <laughs> You know, I, I, I want to also comment on things that uh, the Senator and, and, and my colleague Tanya have, have talked about. I mean, the changes in work style, people can work at home at times, and, and we're seeing increasing that. And so trying to encourage employers to look for those opportunities so people don't have to drive back and forth. And for employers to look at the own, their own transportation patterns. We're, stop. <laughs> stop, son. Uh, let's see, Tanya Meyer will start this one, and this is about um, uh, urban planning. With Medford annexing and increasing in size, isn't this more urban sprawl? How environmentally sound is this concept? Tanya Meyer starts for a minute. Um, I, I don't know if I, I know enough about it to, to give it such a negative connotation. So, so um, again, you know, this, the land use planning that um, um, our very progressive um, forefathers have uh, enacted back in the day is is something that has made our quality of life I believe and it is something that we, it will continue to shape our quality of life we all want to know what we can do with our pro our own property we need clarity about that but we also need to know what our neighbors can do with their property you know, we, we want to know whether they can put an asphalt plant in or not so land use is, is what we need now the, Somebody's got to somebody's got to take that growth, and Medford has decided to do it. Central Point's decided to do it. Ashland has decided not to do it. I think again, as as a, as a county, all we can really do is really try to encourage them to to adopt code and um, land use regulations that really seeks to do a lot more infill and save that that other inventory for later as best we can. So we don't need to just go build it out. Let's really encourage them to do some infill. Right. Kevin Talbert. Well, you know, the battles on uh, land use have really been fought, and I think of the days when uh, Carol Doty was commissioner, and had, she has the scars to prove it, and so did a lot of our uh, county policy makers and other people that, 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 that had the courage, really, to, uh, to say, let, let, let's plan ahead, and let's try to create urban growth boundaries, and let's create when cities reach those, and that city chooses to grow some urban... Uh, uh, opportunity areas, I'm not saying the, the, the term correctly. So, so we, we've established those. Those are not going to change. Uh, we, we, we really have fought those battles. And yes, we should encourage high density like Ashland has. We should not encourage urban sprawl. But I think because of the foresight of the people that worked on land use planning in Oregon, we're not going to have uncontrolled sprawl. We're, 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 we're going to have a secure future, and uh, thanks to the people that came before us to make that. Senator Bates. Uh, and ditto the people ahead of us, uh, Senate Bill 100 back in the 70s. We were the first state to have urban growth boundaries. We had other states that even just let them build out. Uh, we need to build in, we need to build up. Um, but my job with this is to not weaken those laws and the pressure to do that at the state level is amazing. Um, we get the pressure every single session to, to open boundaries up, to drop laws, make the processing simpler and faster. I hear over and over that we're holding back business by not doing this. In the long run, I don't think it works. If you have a good, clean environment, if you don't have urban sprawl, you have an easy way for people back and forth to work. In the long run, that builds more jobs. Spraying it out all over the county does not do it. And I'm particularly concerned about some of the urban growth that happened in Central Port and other places on the best farmland in the valley. Mm -hmm. It's been yes. paved over now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm concerned about those issues, but I, my job will be to fight to make those things not change, to maintain the laws we have. Kevin Talbert, you get to start this one, and it's about the uh, the WISE project that was referred to earlier about piping irrigation water, essentially enclosing all the irrigation ditches in Jackson County. What do you know about the cost estimates to complete the project, and how would you propose to finance it? 
Well, I'm, I'm glad that uh, I see Eric Dittner here in the audience, one of my mentors around trying to understand this project. But I've been out talking to people, and as Tanya and I mentioned, we got a, we got a, a tour to actually see some of this. And it's, a, it's, it's really an exciting project. Uh, because, and why is it exciting? Because it is going to preserve agriculture here in this valley. Uh, we've talked about you know, the, the changes in climate change, lack of snow melt, less water being available. We don't have the storage for it. We, and we also have part of, about a third of all of our irrigation water comes from the Klamath watershed. And the future of that's uncertainty because of recent decisions about who owns that water. So we, we, our, our viable agricultural section, uh, 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 sector, it, you know, is really at risk. And so we, we, we've got to find ways uh, to make that viable. And the WISE project can save and make possible almost as much water as we stand to lose in the climate. Did you give a dollar amount? Uh, let's go to Senator Bates. Can, can we talk about this one more? I mean, I, I, I realize you want to have one minute answers, but you know, why is this a simple project? It's one of the most important things around this climate change issue. Well, we've got three other questions I want to get in before we're done here. So, Senator well, Bates, can you take this? Thank you, real quickly. Um, the WISE project is something we're going to have to do as global warming occurs and water becomes more scarce and the climate wants its water back, which we're stealing from it. I think it's going to be a big change with the cost of the water is. And agriculture has to be maintained in the valley. Uh, I saw a price tag in this one time. It was, it was a 20 or 30 year project. It's not a simple one. It's very complex. Covering, I mean, I covered mine, but that was, you know, a thousand feet. That's nothing. They, I, we're talking about covering huge ditches that are going to take a long time to clean up and take care of the leakage out of them, the evaporation out of them, the rest of it. The numbers I saw were, were I, mean, I may be wrong on this, and so you've got the numbers. I, I remember what he said as we were on the tour, but, yeah. but again, they're I, doing the, the I studies I saw three now. quarters of a billion dollars at one point, yeah. and I'm not sure it's that high yeah. anymore. It's 250 to 450. They're, they're, well, they're, they're actually doing a study right now, and they're going to come up with a number within the next month, they, they have told it's, us. It's serious money for a serious job over a long period of time. Right. That was the end of Senator Bates' comment, a little <laughs> mixing here. Tanya Mara, you have a minute. And again, um, it's, it's just an investment that we need to make for our, you know, to have the long view for our kids and grandkids. Um, so we're just going to have to find the, find the money. And the growers get it. We, we went to, to talk to the orchardists of Harry and, Harry and David, and they know what the, the benefits are. That you know, there's all kinds of cost savings that they have. They don't have to replace the filters as much if they've got the stuff piped in. They can actually access water every day if they need it. Right now, we still have those rotations where you get it, you get it on for a day and then it's off for for three. So that makes it really difficult for them to manage. And so we will. I, I, I don't doubt that we're going to get the private industry to actually make some contribution to this project. So we can find the money. It's just a matter of, of um, getting out there, finding out what the figure is, getting out there and advocating and, and finding the sources. All right. Uh, Senator Bates will start this one, and it's the train question. <coughs> one of several, it turns out. But this one, is it possible to get train service from Medford or Ashland to Portland? The nearest Amtrak station is in Klamath Falls, more than 60 miles away. Trains are the most energy efficient mode of transportation. Um, we just finished getting the train, or just we're in the process of getting the trains rolling from uh, the Wheat Junction up to Roseburg by opening up three of the tunnels and improving the tracks. Freight, track. trains. Uh, freight trains. That's freight trains. Freight trains, and, and I'm leading to it. Um, and I can do it 10 seconds. You my time. <laughs> <laughs> Those freight trains, uh, because it's the easiest way to go, the fastest way to go, and every time you put a train through, you take trucks off the road. So that's what yes. we're trying to do here. It's the right way to do it. Uh, the problem of getting a train from uh, from Medford to Eugene or to Portland is that the trip from here to Roseburg takes eight to ten hours, another eight to ten hours from there on up to Eugene, because the tracks were built to be very slow, very twisty, and to move those tracks, straighten them out, and make the changes necessary for a high-speed train is incredibly expensive. I think the best option we got is to get people a way of getting people cheaply, quickly, easily to Climate Falls and go up that way, which is a fairly quick train up Eugene and through. 
the way getting back and forth is the hard part right now, and the trains aren't reliable because they get second they get secondarily put off by the freight trains. I've spent two days over there one time waiting for it to come through. It just had you know, to derail yeah. Not the train I was on. Right, but the one ahead of me. Yeah. So you know, you got that's the kind of things you got to change. Okay. And Tell me the way to do it. Well, again, I, I look forward to diving into that law so we can figure out what we need to do in order to change it. And and so, uh, you know, if, if we, we are the county that says, Here, here's what we need, um, the state legislature, then that's that's the kind of leadership we need. And I think um, I'm really anxious to be able to do that. So if the, if the solution is to go to climate first, that's fine. Let's let's get it done and let's make sure that we aren't second, the passenger isn't second secondary. And I don't know what it will take, but we might have to, um, I don't know, we might have to buy some, some, we might have to even think about, I guess, condemnation or eminent domain. Who knows? I mean, I honestly think that this is really important. So I'll throw that out there. Kevin Tower? I don't know anything about this issue, so I'm going to talk about water. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, get that anyway. I'm, going to, I'm going to learn about the rail uh, issue if I become commissioner, and like Tanya, I'm going to help solve it at the county level to the extent we can. But hey, I just want to say something about this WISE project. People have talked about it as though, you know, it's going to cost hundreds of millions of dollars. We can't afford it. You know, let's remember the Jackson County Courthouse, one of our beautiful buildings here in Southern Oregon, was built in the height of the Depression. The current irrigation systems that we all benefit from were built 100 years ago when people didn't have very much money. And were they afraid? Were they afraid and said, oh, it's going to cost too much? No, they didn't say that. They said, we want a better life for our kids. We want to build an infrastructure that will help the Valley be successful when we're gone. And I, I just... I just don't think we've lost all that. We have the we need to have the courage. We need to have the courage to look ahead and say what's good for the people that come after us. Yeah. Since you're talking about the age in which these things were built, I should point out the railroad was built in 1887, and it was not good engineering then. <laughs> this is Cow Creek Canyon is the big problem. Yeah. Uh, let's go to, this one is actually about immigration and migration, and Tanya Moore will start this round. Two, two final questions here. Um, what long-range plans would you implement to prepare for the mass migration into our area due to climate change? Oh. <laughs> yeah, um, I, you know, I chose to live here 25 years ago, and I try to keep it quiet about how lovely it is. Um, it, it's, this is going to be a place um, where more people want to find a sanctuary, I think. Um, it, it comes down to land use planning again. But what we're going to end up experiencing, I think, is a, an astronomical increase in our, in our property values and our residence values and stuff. And that may be good for, for us that, that have those investments. but. That's that's going to be it. If we don't have inventory and um, we don't have any technical way of like, excluding people, um, that's going to be something that we probably should start planning for again. Um, but bottom line is density, infill, and go up. Right. You know, so that's again, it's the, the same potential solution. But I do think we may end up having more people here than than our our 20-year plan may predict at this point. Kevin Talbert, preparing for migration, mass migration. Well, we don't really know the future. We, we have ideas about it, and I've heard this, this speculation, but uh, the Center for Population Studies at Portland State has been predicting for some time that within the next 30 to 50 years, we could see a doubling of population here in the Rogue Valley. So we better, we better plan for it, and uh, we are fortunate that it really is our land use laws and our uh, regulatory environment that, that allows us to have some control about that. Uh, I used to think you could stop growth, uh, and I used to uh, be out there really wanting to do that. And, uh, and I guess I've come to think that, that where there's money, there's going to be pressure to do that. And what it's really important is that people that want to see it done responsibly organize themselves to support people like Senator Bates that are going to hold the line and not be subject to special interests that want growth for their profit and not for the good of those of us that are here. Senator Pace, and then you do it, I could have said it better, and I won't say it better. Um, <laughs> we've got to hold the line. It's going to happen. When people want to move here, and you can't blame them from doing that. You can't 
act like we're special because we were born here or raised here or I've been here 35 years. I'm not. People want to come and live here. We have to remember why they want to come here. This is a great place to live. We've got water. We've got uh, great natural resources that you go out and enjoy. Uh, you have to maintain those, protect those, and, and do the right thing with them. I, I look at Ashland sometimes thinking, for all the prisons some people have of Ashland, they've actually done the right thing. They've cut the big box stores out. They've developed Olympia Park. They've gone in, not out. They have not gone across the freeway. They're not going across the freeway. Uh, they're a model for the rest of our community here. And I'd like to see the other parts of the community do the same thing they're doing and be in a situation where when we do double that population, which we're going to, it's going to happen, that it happens in a way that, that the people who moved here for that end up having what they want and don't spoil by coming here. We can do it. We can do it, and we will. Final question is uh, both about fossil fuel and safety. What is Oregon doing to stop dangerous rail transport of coal and chemicals, I assume this means uh, uh, crude oil as well, to reduce explosions? Communities don't need these threats. Kevin Talbert, this is yours for a minute. Well, once again, Senator Bates will be the expert on this because we're talking a lot of it about the Columbia River Corridor and other, other, other places where these issues are, are first and foremost. And, um, you know, I think we have to have a, a, a process where the people that are impacted by these have a chance to, to, to be part of the discussion around what is the best thing to do. Uh, you know, I, I go back to a little bit of the NIMBY thing about, you know, I, you, you can't stop everything that, that is where there are forces at work, but you can shape it. And uh, I, I would like to see uh, us act responsibly. People that are having hazardous materials uh, coming by rail through their communities have a right to, to know about that and make their own choices about it. Uh, the impact on the Columbia River Corridor and on the ocean uh, with some of these export facilities uh, could be tremendous, and people should have an opportunity to be involved in this discussion. Senator Bates. Yeah, um, the state and the federal government have a lot to say about this. Um, we're going to have to change the kind of cars that are handling the oil and fuels being moved by rail, which I don't like in the first place, we got to cover up those coal cars and make sure they're as safe as possible until we can actually get rid of them. Uh, Governor uh, uh, Kitsar is really hot on this. He's been watching it carefully. Uh, we, have, we have some control over it, but not a lot. We have some control over it, and we're going to keep putting as much pressure as we can on that to make it safe. Strangely enough, the manufacturer of the best and safest car for handling oil is, is in Portland, Oregon. And, um, which this is strange if you know Portland, you know, it's pretty strange. But encouraging companies like that on the short run while we get rid of these type of fuels, I think is the best thing we can do. There is real danger here, and you blow up one of those cars that's rolling through uh, Portland, Oregon, and we're going to have a real problem. We don't want that to happen. Tanya, our final answer is yours. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I agree with both of, of what they said, and um, I don't know too much uh, about the issue to add to it other than, you know, if public safety, then there are, there are ways for which we can influence the federal interest as well as the business interests that are involved, and that should come foremost, and I'm sure our, our governor is looking into it, and we'll, we'll probably... Um, Handle it, and maybe it'll take some legislation. And we need to we need to send Senator Bates back to Salem. <laughs> and with that, we close the question and answer portion of the evening. Please uh, join me in thanking in turn Senator Alan Bates. For the <laughs> Democratic candidate for Jackson County Commissioner position is one. Tanya Mara. And independent candidate for Jackson County Commissioner position number three, Kevin Powell.